All right, it's 5 p.m. now. I'd say we should start. Hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Jakob Freund. I'm one of the two founders and CEO of um, Camunda. And next to me is Daniel Meyer. Daniel is um, our technical lead for the Camunda BPM platform. So the first question now is, what exactly is a technical lead, Daniel? Um, yes, hi, um, I'm Daniel. As ja um, Jacob said, I'm the technical lead for Camunda. Um, I'm, well, I'm responsible for the project um, in a technical way. So I'm, I'm, uh, I try to um, work very closely together with the other developers. I try to do a little development myself and um, I then also, um, I'm involved in the roadmap and um, those kind of things. All right, thank you, Dal. So, yeah, you're basically the one who makes it happen. That's um, how I like to phrase it. And um, just by the way, as a fun fact, it's also Daniel's birthday. So I think you turned 29 today, didn't you? Yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> the last time I'm under 30, so the last birthday on the under 30. Uh. Right, so yeah. And uh, what, what else could you do on your birthday than giving a release webinar together with me? So I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, Great. So let's start. Um, as um, you probably um, guessed already, this is about the new release of Camunda BPM, the BPM platform. And just as a quick introduction, in case you're not that familiar yet with the product, um, Camunda is all about yeah, process or business process management, especially business process automation. This means specifically that in its very core, we have... Um, created a, a BPMN a conformant process engine that is able to execute structured workflows. Um, as you probably know, BPMN is a standard um, that is all about describing business processes in a yeah, user-friendly graphical way um, that is also directly executable in process automation engines such as Camunda. Besides that, Camunda is also about not so structured workflows, um, also called cases. And there's also a standard about that called CMMN, which stands for the case management model and notation, also by OMG. So um, these two um, yeah, are at the very heart of it uh, within Camunda. And Camunda is also about process automation, especially in Java environments. So as a rule of thumb, if you don't have any Java developers within your organization, Camunda may not be the right choice for you. But if you do have Java developers, Camunda should actually be the first choice when it comes to process automation. Um, besides this, um, last but not least, Camunda is open source, which is, of course, especially important if um, yeah, we're talking about developer friendliness, about a minimal vendor lock in, um, all those things that yeah, make Camunda attractive basically. So when looking at who's actually using it, this is mostly uh, companies and organizations in Europe. Um, that's where we come from, from Berlin, Germany, to be specific, but also more and more organizations outside Europe. So um, for example, we uh, we have several software vendors in North America using Camunda already. We have um, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority there. Um, there is um, an APEC, for instance, Allianz Insurance, um, their branch in Indonesia, um, and a very big Australian public institution using Camunda. Within Europe, it's mostly about uh, the finance and insurance industry and also about telco providers. So um, not very surprising, probably. Okay, so that's about it for Camunda for now. Um, this webinar is not um, about a general introduction to Camunda. It's about what has actually happened with the new release. What, what, what can you expect from that new version that just came out um, on, on Friday? So let's have a look at this. Uh, first of all, let me say that you can expect um, to, to um, you, can, you can expect new releases of Camunda more or less every six months. So we're working time boxed, which means um, yeah, we've been working six months on on this release, and you can expect the next release 7.4 end of November already. So um, as yeah. The last part of this webinar, I will also tackle this at least briefly, what you can expect with the next release even. But this is obviously about 7.3 that we're talking about now. Um, yeah, the, the way to, to this release um, has been mostly about creating a generic, powerful BPM infrastructure. So when we started Camunda as a standalone open source uh, BPM project two years ago, it was mostly about providing powerful integrations for application servers, about providing a cockpit that is about monitoring, um, improving scalability, um, creating a totally new and, 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 and I think quite good REST API, things like that. Um, 
But the 7.1 release um, about a year ago was mostly about finishing the stack, which means we have increased the coverage of um, the BPM N2O standard. We have uh, once again improved the performance, um, all those things. Then in 7.2, which came out, yeah, six months ago, um, we had some fundamental extensions and an innovation really in the product. Things like um, that new standard um, for case management that I already mentioned, but also a totally new task list, things like that. So this release now that, that we just um, brought out is mostly customer driven. So this means we have customers like T-Mobile Austria, for instance, using Commander BPM for very mission critical, absolute core business processes. And they have certain requirements um, that, that are about those kind of use cases. Um, so this is why I would call this release a mostly usage driven release which is of course very interesting because um, most probably you will have very similar requirements and use cases that you would like um, yeah, to, to, to see covered by Camunda. So um, let's talk about this now. And the best way to talk about that is uh, looking at the typical BPM cycle, as you probably know it already. So this is not no no Camunda specific rocket science or whatever. It's really how we typically work on and, and improve business processes. So we have typically those four stages of um, an analyzing. Um, as is processes, looking at yeah, weaknesses and potential improvements and things like that. Then we have on the right hand side the design phase, which is all about creating to be processes, um, to be process models, really, and um, yeah, just making up our mind about how it could actually work better. And this concept then has um, yeah, to be implemented in the implementation stage, which is about technical implementation as well, of course, as um, yeah, actually organizational implementation. And once that has been achieved and completed, we're going into production and we, we actually operate those processes. And yeah, we have this, that, that continuous improvement life cycle here. So when, when looking at this and looking at the tools that you get with Camunda, I mean, as always, the process engine runs under the hood. But when looking at the surface of things, you see tools like, like Cockpit and Tasklist. Uh, you'll see modelers like the Eclipse-based modeler, our new project, bpmn.io, things like that. So we have actually been working on almost all of these. Um, but what I would like to cover in this webinar now um, are some highlights that um, mostly that are mostly about the left hand side of things about operations. So we have uh, created some 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 very um, yeah great and disruptive improvements in cockpit, which are about monitoring. Um, we have improved the task list, and we have also done things around admin, which is mostly about uh, yeah granting permissions and authorizations. So um, yeah, this is where, we, where we're currently standing. And let's now look at the concrete new features that you can expect in this new release. So first of all, we have something that we call process instance modification. Then we have, uh, yeah, the matter of authorizations. We have um, the options of, um, of, of plugins, of actually customizing task list in the way that you would like it to be. And we have also added even more application service and databases that we officially support uh, with Camunda. There's, as I said, many more improvements. Um, some of them I would like to cover briefly, but those first four, um, yeah, are actually worth taking a close look at them. So let's just do it. Right, so what about modification? What is this all about? Um, in a nutshell, it's about allowing you to, to skip or repeat certain steps within your processes at a runtime, really. Um, also, it's about changing the current state of a process instance, what we also call um, yeah, the token move. So this sounds a bit abstract, but I will live demo it in, in a minute. Um, the main use cases for this new, quite powerful feature really are uh, um, yeah, repairing running process instances. So whenever you have you know, an issue at runtime, um, you need to fix what's currently happening, um, you can do this. It's about migrating process instances. So as you probably know, um, process definitions within Camunda are, are versioned. So when you deploy a new version of a process definition, um, the process instances are still running in the previous version. So um, this makes it easier to actually migrate those process instances. And it's also about testing. So this allows you to test certain steps or certain, um, yeah, a certain number of steps within your process without the need to actually start uh, the process instance from the beginning. So this comes in very handy, as you can imagine. Okay. So when looking at this feature now, one thing is very important. Um, a thing that Camunda is not a 
um, who say that you know closed suite um, that is really just one 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 block of software that you can only access using the provided user interface. Camundo is a, a a very loosely coupled number of of components that are nicely integrated, but that can also be used and integrated with standalone from your application. This makes it so incredibly flexible, really. So this means on the left hand side, we're looking at the stack, and we can see um, at its very core we have. Yeah, the process engine, obviously, executing uh, the models, the XML files, basically. Um, that engine can be accessed using um, the Java API. On top of that Java API, then, is our layered, the so-called REST API, which allows us to provide or expose the features of Camunda to other platforms um, than Java. And on top of that, again, we uh, use the REST API in order to provide web applications implemented in HTML5 with things like JavaScript, AngularJS, etc. Um, and those web applications communicate with the Camunda backend using that, that REST API. So the very same APIs are also available for you. So let's just imagine you want to create your very own user interface, which is a rather likely use case, really. Um, you can create those user interfaces and talk to the very same REST API we use ourselves. Um, you can even embed the very same SDKs and libraries that we use ourselves that are about, for example, um, yeah, rendering, displaying BPMN diagrams and even allowing people to edit and change those BPMN diagrams using BPMN.io. Um, so as you can see, whenever we talk about those features, it's about um, using those features on those different levels of the architecture. So you can use them um, by the REST or the Java API or as an end user via the provided applications. Let's make this a bit more concrete by looking at one simple example. So in this simple process, we have uh, three steps. Uh, the first one is about the review of an invoice, second one is about archiving it, and the third one on the right hand side is about preparing the bank transfer. So let's assume now that we're currently pending in um, that third step. So the process instance is now pending at the user task prepare bank transfer. For whatever reason, we figured out at runtime that in this specific process instance, we need to repeat the archive invoice step and then yeah, come back to that to that third user task. So we have to yeah, move back basically. So how can we do this? Um, we can do this, for example, by using the Java API. So now this becomes a bit geeky. So please don't be um, scared of. But for all of for all those of you who are developers themselves, um, um, it's probably quite interesting to see how this can work. So um, in the first step, we actually get the process instance by querying um, um, an instance that uh, has a certain invoice ID. So now that we have the process instance at hand, we can actually get the activity instance of a particular user task that we um, actually want to, yeah, that we want to move the token from. And then in the third step, we actually perform the modification. So we basically cancel the token that is currently pending at that user task, and we create a new token just before um, the activity that we want to execute again. That's how it works. Right. Um, Daniel, do you have anything to add? Um, no, you, you explain, I think you, you covered it perfectly. Um, I, I just want to add that, um, yes, I, I, well, I, I kind of like how we, how we were able to like work out this API and make it, I hopefully make it understandable in a way that people can see, um, how, how you can use it, um, how you can also, um, compose complex modifications, um, using this fluent API. Um, in, in this example, we show two instructions starting before an activity also cancelling an activity instance you can also then pass in variables local variables do modification on, on data it works with um, complex bpmn processes with basically all the symbols that the process engine supports and um, i think um, the guys that worked on this mostly um, thorn really did a great job in, in in working out this api i'm actually quite quite proud of it <laughs> Right, yeah, thanks. So, yes, this is about using this um, with the API. So now let's look at the end user point of view. So let's look at another example where we want to change um, the, the current status or basically move that token uh, using the cockpit user interface. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my desktop and hopefully I won't experience any issues. So you should 
see my, my screen right now. And what we can do now is we can just have a look at uh, the task list. So I'm not going to explain the task list now from scratch because this is not, as I said, about the general introduction, but about the new features. So task list now allows me to start a new process instance. And I'm going for that um, for that for that invoice process that also comes as a default example when you download Camunda. So let's say this is about I know ten dollars and that's how we do it. Okay. Now we have that first step here, which is about um, yeah signing the appropriate approval for that particular invoice that we are supposed to pay. So let's just say um, for the sake of simplicity, I will assign myself. So now I have the follow-up step in my personal inbox, um, which is which is here within the BPMN diagram, and now I will um, yeah actually approve that invoice. So let me just do this quickly. Okay, I don't see the task right now because it has been assigned not to my user but to a certain um, group. So when looking at all tasks, I can see that that group accounting is supposed to work on that on that task over here. Um, so the thing now is let's assume that for whatever reason um, we've messed up. So it's not it's not supposed to be pending here really. For whatever reason um, um, we need to change this process instance. We need to repair it so to say, so to speak. So this means that let's just assume um, yeah we should actually was a, was a mistake to prove that invoice, we actually have to review it again and we have to review it. So we have that review invoice step up there. So let's let's move this now. How can we do this? Um, as a typical, you know, um, worker or process participant, um, I typically don't have that authorization. Um, so I will I will reach out to my operators or administrators and um, escalate the whole matter. So at some point, some user who has the appropriate authorization will log into cockpit. Um, look at that particular process invoice. We'll see, okay, we have one um, invoice currently being processed. It's pending here. So let's have a look at this. And we can see, um, looking at the history, what happened so far, da, 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 da. and now we want to actually, yeah, move this token. We want to change this current status. So what I can do now is, or oh, one way um, for doing this is drag and drop. So let's grab this token. Oops, pardon me. Oh, sorry, I have to switch to runtime. Okay, there we go. Let's grab it, move it up there, and drop it on the flow node where it should be pending. And this could actually be anything. It could be this user task here, but it could also be a gateway or um, an end event even, so or whatever kind of event. So it's about flow nodes, really, as the BPM that calls them, gateways, activities, and events. So let's um, drop it here. Okay. And now I have to um, I have to confirm this because as I'm being told, I'm playing with fire, which is of course true. So let's proceed. And as we can see, okay, this worked. So we, the token has been moved over there. So let's have a look at it um, yeah, as someone working in the task list. So when refreshing this task list, it's telling me this task doesn't exist anymore, but there is another one, um, which is about reviewing that invoice now pending in my, in my inbox. When looking at the history again, we can see what happened so far. So first we went, you know, up there and down there, and then we went here. And then we have that orange um, orange tag, which means um, this activity has been cancelled um, because, yeah, we obviously moved, moved up there. So yeah, you know, I don't know if you're one of those um, like me who 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 really love to play um, um, PC games, you know, like ego shooters and everything. And if you are, there's some something called God mode, and this actually feels a bit like the God mode, which is just my personal take, probably. But um, I really like it. So um, I can even do things like, okay, um, review invoice. Um, actually, I don't. Yeah, actually, let's 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 review it a couple of times. So what I can do now is, I can say, um, let's not only create one token, let's create a few more. Like this this so like four more token and apply this yes i'm sure i'm going to do this there we go and now we have four tasks pending or five um, altogether pending in my inbox well as you can see this is um yeah serious stuff in a way so this is not something that you want um to allow everyone in your organization to do but it's as you can imagine extremely powerful um Right, so let's go back to um, the slides because as I just mentioned, um, I don't want to allow it um, everyone, or I don't want to allow everyone to do this. So this means um, we need to talk about authorizations. All right, 
next thing on the agenda, really. So what is this all about? Well, I think it's quite obvious. So what is actually the improvement that we made? Um, you could already define permissions uh, within Camunda in, in the previous releases, but this one is way more powerful when it comes to how to define permissions. So let me just explain how it basically works. Um, it's all about Camunda Admin. That's the web application that allows you to do these things. Um, as always, um, you can um, yeah, do it using um, that, that, that application, but you can also um, do it using the APIs, but that's a different matter that Daniel will cover quickly uh, in a couple of minutes. So um, here on the left-hand side, we can see the resource types that we can um, actually look at in order to grant or um, deny permissions. So we have things like applications, for example, like Cockpit, tasks, just etc. We have things like um, yeah, authorizations themselves, but also deployments and filters, and also process definitions, um, which is the, the, in a way, most powerful part um, in here. Um, so what I can do now is I can pick the, the kind of, of resource that I want to look at in terms of, of permissions. And then I can say here in this column called type, whether I want to actually allow or deny something to someone. And then I can say, okay, I want to allow let's say, for instance, a user or a group to do something. And then I can say in the third column, permissions, what exactly I want to, um, yeah, I want, I want to allow or to deny. And in the fourth column here, um, called resource ID, I can say whether this is true for, for, all, for all resources of this type or a specific resource, such as an application like task list, for example. Right, so let's have a look at what kind of permissions I can actually um, grant or or deny. So basically, it's all about creating, reading, updating, or deleting stuff, which is not very surprising, probably. So um, looking at, for example, process definitions, which I already mentioned, um, this means, for example, I can say for all process definitions or for a specific process definition, I want to load uh, certain things. So let's just say for um, the process definition invoice, so it's all about the invoice process, I want to allow, uh, to allow a certain group or user to create new process instances, or in other words, to start this process. Or I want to allow them to actually look at um, running process instances or working on them or even canceling them things like that. So this is all possible um, using using this approach here. Daniel, anything to add on the technical side of things? Um, well, again, you, you covered it quite well, I think. Um, what, what, is, um, what I can add is that um, those kind of authorizations are um, enforced by the system on different levels. So um, the way it works is they are stored in the database and then um, when you um, communicate or interact with the Java API, for example, retrieve a list of tasks, then um, in, at the query or at the database level, then we will actually make sure that um, that query or that API call does not return any tasks that you are not authorized to see. Um, the same is true for other interactions like um, starting a process instance, um, um, deleting a process instance, all kind of things. So those are at the end of the day, in Forest, either at the database level, then at the Java API level, and then at the REST API level. REST API level being very imp uh, important because you expose your REST API over the internet, basically, to the whole world. And there you want to make sure that since everybody can access that, the, that once you grant log into people, that they can only perform the actions or only see the resources that they actually authorize to see um, or manipulate. So, yeah, that's what I can add to that. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Exactly. Uh, just one thing that I forgot to mention um, in the beginning, because people already start using this. On the left-hand side, you can see a chat window. So when you have any questions um, about what we are discussing or presenting, um, just feel free to ask it using that, that chat window on the left-hand side. Maybe Daniel can answer it right away, or we will cover it at the end of the webinar. So that's that's how we can do the Q&A thing. Okay, right. So let's um, let's have a look at this this feature here, uh, which is about authorization. So I just mentioned um, how to ensure that certain groups or users can do certain things or not do certain things um, for certain processes, for example. So let's let's have a look at um, how this works. Um, I will square square. I will share my screen again. All right. There we go. Okay, so um, what I would like to do now is uh, looking at the invoice process and we have certain 
we have certain users who are supposed to work with that. So this, these are just the demo users that I can find here in Camunda Admin. And what I can see here is a user, for instance, called Marianne. And when looking at Marianne, we can see that she is part of a group called Accounting, which makes sense for Invoice, obviously. So um, right now, that group accounting cannot really do a lot. So when looking at the process definitions, yeah, there are no specific authorizations for that accounting group, um, which means that when I log in as, as Mary now, let's just do it quickly. Okay, so this is, I'm now using a different browser in order to, because, you know, using Chrome with the super user and using Firefox um, for the demo purpose with a normal user. And this is now Mary, Mary Ann's personal task list. And as you can see here, um, not much to do when I try to start a process, um, nothing is available, which is um, because I don't have the appropriate authorization, obviously. So let's allow Mary now to actually start new invoice process instances using the task list in this example. Um, I can do this by defining a new permission or authorization. So I want to allow, I would say not only Mary, but all members of the group accounting to read the process definition of the invoice process to create new instances and also look at those instances. That should be it for now at least. So it's all about the invoice process really. Okay. So let's see whether there, there's anything more to do now for Mary. I will try to start a process again. And now I have that invoice um, process available, so I can just kick it off again. Let's say this time it's about burgers. Um, it's $10 again. And yeah, that's about it. All right, so since I'm Mary Ann and not the demo user, I don't see any task in here right now, but I can look at all tasks because I have that, that filter available that has been defined for me. And I can see, okay, there's that new thing, which is about Hello Burger. It's about the assign approver step again. So um, yeah, that's how it works basically. Um, let's make um, just one more test. Let's look at another user called, um, I think it's called John. So John is part of another group called sales. So John is not supposed to be able to do anything about the invoice process. So let's um, sign out and sign in as John again. And let's see whether that's true. And as you can see here, okay, John is still not able to, to kick off new invoice um, invoices. All right, so I, I suppose you get the idea. And um, as you hopefully also um, yeah, see already, this is, this is a quite powerful feature actually that allows me to yeah, define very fine-grained um, permissions uh, within my organization. And as Daniel already said, it's not only enforced on the user interface um, level, but also at the very back end of things. So you can really, you know, um, really ensure that no one within your organization um, is able to do certain things that they're not allowed or that they shouldn't be able to do. You can even create things like, you know, read-only bits that are only about monitoring certain processes, things like that. Okay. Good. So what's left? Um, it's about the plugins and task list. So there's not much to live demo here, but it, it's um, I can explain it very briefly. And um, again, it's, I think, a quite powerful improvement, really. So um, plugins is a concept that we introduced um, already one and a half years ago with Cockpit, really. So Cockpit is um, yeah, all, all about monitoring. So since people had so different requirements in terms of monitoring and who should be able to do, to do things and uh, et cetera, we um, um, actually created an architecture that allows you to create your very own plugins for Cockpit. So there's even um, yeah, kind of a marketplace available where people can publish the plugins that they have created for Cockpit. And um, this example here, for instance, is my favorite plugin, really. It's about a heat map. So this means means um, you can hit the button on the right hand side and you can actually see yeah as a heat map which um, parts of the process has been or have been executed most often so this allows you to yeah identify bottlenecks and things like that and it has not even been created by ourselves so this plugin was created by a um, pretty cool guy called Matthias Wiedemann he's working with Opitz Consulting and um, yeah we're really grateful for that and it's just you know it's available for free um, at the Camunda plugin store. So it makes a lot of sense to um, yeah, make this concept also available for the task list, which what we did, which we did with um, the 7.3 release. So with the new task list, there are certain points where you can 
modify and extend the existing plugins. So you can, for instance, introduce um, additional actions that people can actually um, yeah, execute on certain tasks or within the task forms and, and all kinds of things. So um, you can, of course, also customize the appearance of the task list in terms of the colors and the logo and, and, and all those kind of things. So um, yeah, hopefully it's, it's obvious that this allows you to customize the task list in the exact way um, that you would like it to be. Next thing on the agenda is about application servers and databases. And um, yeah, this is about also a rather powerful concept. I even like to call it a killer feature in a way because it's something that distinguishes Kamunda from, uh, from other BPM products in the field. So typically, you know, when looking at traditional BPM suites, they only allow you to interact with them using um, yeah, their web service APIs. And this makes it, of course, quite difficult to actually create powerful, flexible process applications where you, you want to seamlessly integrate the process engine with the rest of your application. So this is why Kamunda is embeddable. You can use it also via the Java API, etc. cetera. Um, of course, it makes a lot of sense, nevertheless, to look at a process engine as a central service or a central component within your application server. So let's just assume you have different process applications. They're all deployed as whatever, WAR files, et cetera, in your application server. And they're all supposed to work um, with, with one central process engine. This is what you can do with Kamunda. And as far as I know, um, to that extent, there's no other BPM product in the field allowing this kind of, of application server integration. Um, yeah, as you can imagine, this is, of course, um, a, a, a big thing, especially um, when we're looking at all those different kind of application servers that are out there. So um, initially, we, we had this for, for JBoss, but now we also have it for very different kinds of application servers, like, like Tomcat and um, the next generation of JBoss Wildfly and, and IBM Web application server and Oracle. And with 7.3, we um, yeah, also support a few more versions of those application servers. And besides this, we also support well, not a few, but several or a lot, of, lot more versions um, of, sorry, <coughs> different databases. So there are about 17 different databases now being supported for, uh, for being used with Kamunda. Um, and all kind of and all kind of versions. And again, this is not a, not a not a small thing because, as you can imagine, in terms of performance and scalability, it's quite important to actually optimize um, those those SQL um, queries. And that's what we did for all those different databases. So, in order to, to actually get this this going, and um, um, in order to ensure quality, especially with with um, test automation, we're running about eight hundred thousand test cases um, whenever we commit something. We had to create and build up a rather big and powerful QA infrastructure um, for running all those application servers in the different versions and all those databases in the different versions within our labs in order to, to um, automate those test cases. And I think the guys did a pretty amazing job here um, by using Docker, really. So we introduced um, Docker as an infrastructure um, solution um, within the last six months. And I think what, what we've created here um, is so interesting that, um, yeah, that even um, at the Jenkins user conference in London, um, I think it's in June, um, two of the guys in our infrastructure team will actually give a presentation about what they've created here. So I don't know what you're putting about this, Daniel, but I think you, I, I suppose you're quite proud of your, of your team in this matter. Uh, yes, uh, we, um, we, we at, 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 a, at some level, we achieved that dream where you uh, kind of um, have this infrastructure as code approach where you can um, just recreate the complete um, a continuous integration um, system just from like repositories that are on GitHub um, where we um, have Docker containers. Um, we have uh, even our Jenkins itself is running inside Docker. We, 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 you can rebuild that complete system. Um, the Jenkins jobs are um, created using um, something called uh, job DSL. And from that, you can really, with the click of a button, um, um, deploy the CI infrastructure to um, to cluster, which may not be that interesting, um, uh, Jacob, to our users, but um, I think um, the result is quite interesting um, for our users because um, it gives you the freedom of choice of um, containers and databases, which you um, don't get if you um, use um, 
like VPN platforms by, for example, the big vendors where you most of the time are limited to using um, also then their application server or their database. Um, so I, th I hope that um, the, the effort and the time we spent on this is, is worth it for our users as well. Um, I think so. Yes, I would certainly agree. So, um, yeah, that, that's about the, the four highlights we wanted to, to cover in detail. Now looking at things that we also improved, um, just, just to mention them, there's things like the user operations log. So, so this is about, um, you know, whenever someone is doing something in Kamunda on, on the user level, like someone operating with cockpit, um, manipulating process instances, changing variable values, canceling process instances, things like that. Um, this all all these things can be can be locked now and um, yeah saved as actions to the database for for the purpose of auditing for example so you can imagine quite important um, especially uh, in sensitive environments um, we've also improved the task list uh, not only in terms of pluggability but also the plugins themselves so for instance we introduced a way more powerful search for for finding tasks and we also um, created the possibility to just upload and attach files out of the box, all those minor improvements that make life easier. Same goes for Cockpit, by the way. Um, also, we have completely refactored the way how we execute so-called multiple instance activities. And this is really... I, need, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're such a BPMN nerd like I am, you're, you're probably quite excited about this. So the, um, the MI activities in BPMN are a very powerful concept. Um, you can recognize them um, with the three bars that you can find on the tasks and sub-processes. And yeah, the app obviously about creating more than one instance about a certain activity based on data, like data collection, for example. So... Um, they might appear kind of exotic, but they really aren't. They're extremely powerful and uh, extremely relevant for for everyday, um, yeah, for the everyday life of a process implementation project. And um, they were already working, but there were certain corner cases, especially in high load situations, where as um, the engine as it existed was not yet optimized. So that's what we did, and it was a quite quite big effort actually to refactor that from scratch, like from the ground. And um, I think the guys did a pretty good job here. Um, also, it's about XML and JSON payload handling. So this means uh, when you like to, you know, um, transform or process XML data or JSON directly within your process, um, we've improved the ways that you can do that. All right. So, um, yeah, as I said, just just a brief overview about the, the, for me, most exciting features. But looking at what's actually open source and what's not, um, here's a little overview. And as you can see, we are still taking open source very, very seriously. So this means almost everything that we created with a new release is available open source. But um, there's one thing that is about enterprise um, edition customers, which is when you actually want to use that process instance modification feature um, in cockpit, you know, the drag and drop thing that I, that I demonstrated. This is a cockpit plugin that is only available for the enterprise edition users. All right. Okay, so this is about 7.3. So um, let's just look what, what else is there. What else can you expect uh, with 7.4? And as I already mentioned, um, it's, not, it's not that far away. So let's have a look at um, what, what, what you can expect. One thing is called bpmn.io, and um, it's not really, you know, it's not coupled or tightly coupled to the Kamona BPM releases. It's a standalone project, really. However, in terms of the timeline, you can expect um, to get something here as well within the upcoming months, really. So let me just demo what's here already and then um, tell you a bit more about that. So I will just share my screen again. One more time. There we go. And let's have a look. So when I point my browser to bpmn.io, I can see that I have the option here to do an online demo. And just trying that out. You can see for yourself what this is about. It's about a BPMN editor that runs in the browser. And obviously, it's quite easy to use. So it's especially, you know, 
nice for, for, for business analysts and other people from the business side um, who don't like to work with Eclipse. And since it's all based on standards, it's really easy to get just get the BPMN XML and uh, yeah, let it run in Camunda. And um, there's also nice features that we're already implementing, like like this one here, for instance, which makes life easier. So a um, good thing to have, actually. Um, what's the current status? It's work in progress, really. So they are not all BPMN symbols already available. Um, we expect them to be available, um, yeah, as I said, within the next month. So some sometime around July, you should um, be able to use almost everything of BPMN. And um, we will also integrate it nicely with the rest of the Kamunda BPM stack. So this is one thing to be aware of. And um, what you can already do is you can not only use the online demo, you can also do, um, you can also just install BPMNIO within your Chrome browser. So what I can do here is I can just point, I'll just go to the Chrome marketplace, um, looking at the setup and then saying, um, well, um, plugins and I want to, look at the Chrome marketplace, looking for BPMN. I'm not surprised to find BPMN.io. And I can just add this. And now I have a standalone offline BPMN model available. So this is also nice, obviously. Um, so we can already benefit from this. All right. So that's the one thing to talk about. The other thing is about, yeah, the Kamuna BPM 7.4, really. So let me just open these slides again. There we go. This is about business rules. So you probably already experienced um, one way or the other um, the relevance of business rules within your organization. And we actually um, 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 yeah, ran a survey in February about um, um, how satisfied people are with their existing business rule execution solutions. And um, it was quite apparent that um, a lot of participants said, well, we're not, we're not really happy with that um, for several reasons, because it's not very really lightweight, it's not really developer friendly, the business IT alignment um, is not really, yeah, not really accomplished. Um, it's, it's not really integrated with our BPM and process automation efforts. So there are business rule solutions out there, but they are apparently not, not that great and not that lean and lightweight. And we want to change this. So what we are going to do now, and we actually kicked off development today, exactly. We are going to implement a new standard from ONG called DMN Decision Model and Notation. So um, it's all about, yeah, let's say the next generation of business rules, really. It allows you to um, define decisions and how decisions are determined in a way that, yeah, the business can actually drive that. The business can not only create, but also maintain, for instance, decision tables. And those decision tables are then directly executed um, um, in a decision engine. And that's exactly what we're creating right now. So there will be a decision engine as part of the Kamunda BPM platform. And um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to add that to the stack. So um, it, means, it means that we are able to implement business processes in terms of structured workflows, in terms of unstructured cases and decisions. So one thing that is especially interesting about that um, yeah, decision management standard is the yeah, possibility to actually yeah, become more agile during operations or at runtime. So as you know, we don't believe in zero code BPM. We know that um, the idea of, you know, the business can create complete process applications in a drag and drop manner, um, that idea is sold again and again, but it's just not true. It's just not working in, in, in the real world. However, there are certain things that are working in the real world, among them changing decision tables at runtime driven by the business or let even do the business those changes um, and this can actually affect the runtime situation without the need for you know complicated um, deployment procedures involving developers again things like that so it allows you to become way more agile once you have a process application in place that's realistic because we have seen that ourselves in practice so as you can imagine this is one of the primary use cases that we are targeting right now when implementing the DMN standard in Kamunda BPM and it means that we're implementing it um, 
on, on, on both levels. We're implementing it um, as part of the back end, so as part of the engine, which is all about execution. And we're also implementing it on the front end side of things. So based on that modeling framework that is the basis for BPMN IO, we will also create um, yeah, a, a modeling solution for decision tables or a decision table editor, basically. So this will be, of course, nicely integrated with the BPMN modeling side of things, but also with the execution side of things within Kamunda. So yeah, in a nutshell, it's all about um, modeling in general with the upcoming release and decision management um, specifically. And yeah, I find that quite exciting, as you can imagine. All right. So I think we, we managed to stay in time. So one last remark before we, we answer a few questions. Um, we often, often people ask us about how they can actually, you know, move ahead with Kamunda, what they can actually do at the next step. And um, it's, it's, I mean, of course, there's several things you can just do on your own. You can just download it for one. So um, you can just go to kamunda.org and download it. It's open source. You don't need to sign up or register or anything. You can just download um, the product and use it right away. You can, um, you know, work through the getting started tutorials you can sign up for the Kamunda network and get some free training um, you can ask in the forum so there's lots of things to do that you could actually just do for yourself without even the need to you know talk to us or anything um, let, alone, let alone pay us what you um, can also do if you want to you know um, accelerate things you can um, look at Kamunda doing a proof of concept workshop that's something where we can actually assist you and um, out of experience makes a lot of sense once you're seriously interested in the technology so a typical proof of concept workshop consists of uh, three yeah, stages or phases basically so let's say we have a four to five days workshop just as an example and the first two days are typically about um, looking at a real world process from your going that you would like to, to automate or yeah, to automate with a BPMN product such as Camunda. So in those first two days, we actually create a potential to be process model in the BPMN standard. We will teach you about BPMN um, at the same time. So it's really learning by doing. And um, we will involve people from the business departments as well as people from the software development. So to actually, you know, achieve that business IT alignment that BPMN is all about. Um, once we have accomplished that, uh, we will implement the process together with your developers or even let your developers implement it. And our consultant is just there as, as a coach and sparring partner. So the process execution um, part is this. Um, again, this is all about your process and your organization. It's about your requirements. So you can look at certain questions such as how to integrate my legacy applications, how to present the user interface in a way that my business users actually accept it, all those kind of things. Can be, can be discussed and even implemented at least in a prototype. And um, yeah, then um, um, at the final stage, we will actually look at what, what we have achieved, what we have accomplished. We will have a live demo for anyone who's interested in terms of stakeholders within the organization. And you will, of course, have certain yeah, lessons that you've learned. So you will know exactly about the potential benefit of such a solution. You will know about the potential risks and efforts you have to consider, all those kind of things. And even if you don't move ahead with Kamunda afterwards, or you, in quotation marks, uh, just move ahead with the open source edition, um, you'll probably have learned a lot of things um, in, in that workshop. So that's why we recommend it. So if you're interested in, interested in that, just reach out to us, drop us an email, call us in Germany or the US, and we can talk about that. All right. So um, thanks for your attention so far. And looking at the chat window, there's a few questions. I don't know, Daniel, if you have already figured some out that you would like to, to answer yourself. Um, yes, there's one question here concerning um, the upcoming um, DMN features. Um, the question is, will DMN models be executable? Um, the answer is yes. So um, it will be, um, the, so the feature will be focused around um, creating um, decision tables using um, a UI, and then also deploying them to a decision engine that we're going to um, design and, and develop from scratch, um, which will then natively execute the DMN standard um, and um, build that as one um, nicely put together. Oh, that's at least what we're going to try to achieve um, as one nicely um, put together stack so that um, this uh, will be easy to use. Um, then there are questions about um, 
the um, modification feature also. Um, one question was what happens with the data um, if you modify a process instance? Um, the answer is, um, well, the process instance is modified in place, so to say. So if you um, start new activities inside a process instance, um, then the um, process variables, as um, we uh, technically call the data within a process instance, will um, remain intact. So um, um, if you have process instance scope variables, those will uh, stay in place. Um, if you have um, variables related to um, um, lower scopes in the process um, um, execution hierarchy, then they will remain in place depending on whether you actually actually cancel those scopes or not. Um, we have a very nice um, documentation on that feature for which I can um, post the link um, into the chat window there most of those questions should be um, addressed. Um, then there was one question about um, authorizations um, and the question was um, will um, users be able to see um, all tasks or only the tasks um, which are assigned to them? Um, the, the answer is um, authorizations um, work on a different level than the um, concepts like task assignment or group assignment, things like that. So authorizations basically say so-and-so user or so-and-so group is either allowed or not allowed to see a certain task. Um, then you can create all kinds of queries. Um, uh, you can freely combine the query criteria. Um, anyway, you do it, even if you don't restrict um, the um, results set using the query criteria, a particular user will only see the tasks um, he or she is authorized to see. So... Um, um, yes, I hope um, that answered that, questions, uh, that question. Um, yes, there were some more um, specific I, questions I, which I directly answered in the chat. Can I take one? Because there's also yeah. one Go or ahead. two that, that I found really interesting. Um, so, um, where is it again? Yeah, one thing is about um, the CMN standards. So someone asking, are there any plans to create the CMN notation in the online modeler? Yes, they are, of course. So CMN is currently only being supported in Camunda on the backend side um, in the execution environment. So you can execute CMN models, but you cannot yet create them graphically using the web modeler that we are working on with bpmn.io. But we have those plans. So um, right now we're focusing full speed on DMN, but you can imagine to get something about CMN modeling more or less beginning next year without, without any promises. Oh, Daniel is already hitting me. <laughs> um, no, but actually that's, that's what we aim for right now. So it's not a no guarantee at all. But um, I mean, if we would guarantee it, we would deliver it on, 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 on time. But I cannot say that for sure right now. But that's what we aim for, Lee. That's our plans. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, yeah. Um, do you have any plans for marketplace for plugins? Um, I already mentioned that. So let me just, actually, I would love to demo that. Um, so I will share my screen one more time. Um, okay. And when looking at camunda.org, and it's really a hidden, a hidden treasure in a way right now. So when looking at camunda.org slash plugins, you will find a, yeah, it's actually kind of a prototype, but it's already working, um, a marketplace for cockpit plugins. So you can find, for instance, the plugin that the patent office in Switzerland created. You can find that heat map plugin that I'm so excited about. Um, you can find a plugin about KPI reports, stuff like that. And you can just, you know, add those plugins to your, yeah, like how you say that card, shopping card. And you can say, okay, I would like to have a cockpit in a certain version for a certain environment that consists or yeah, includes these plugins and actually excludes already existing plugins because, I don't know, I don't want people to be able to do this kind of things. Um, that's already available for cockpit. As I said, it's um, actually the result of a hackathon that we had last year. So it's, it's working, you can use it, but it's not officially supported. So to answer your question, um, yes, obviously we have the plan to, to provide such a marketplace in a stabilized way. And we will provide it for cockpit as well as for task list. So um, this is not tied to a Camunda release. Um, so, so just, you know, watch out, um, follow us on Twitter. Um, what's our Twitter account again? Can you just post that in the chat window? Um, because that's actually the spot where you will be notified about um, those things as soon as they're actually available. Right, so um, let me just... 
<laughs> okay, that that's a cool question. That's a question um, about a feature that we don't have. So uh, I mean, uh, it makes sense to cover that as well. So someone asking, um, is it possible to use colored BPMN symbols with Kamunda? Which I find an exciting request. Um, however, it's not uh, seriously, but it's not it's not possible right now. So when you're creating BPMN diagrams, um, at least with BPMN.io, we don't have any feature which is about how to how to actually color those steps. And if you render them in cockpit, um, you wouldn't have any specific colors as well. Or am I am I wrong actually, Daniel? Um, no, out of the box that that doesn't work. That's true, but um, based on on the API we have there in BPMN.io, that's um, something which is not very uh, very hard to implement um if you look at the way we we use um bpmnio for example in, in the cockpit application we already create all kinds of highlights and overlays which um um yeah like give color to to the shapes um the only thing that would be needed here and and um we have the the very beautiful infrastructure for implementing that as well would be to actually persist those uh, things in the model and in, in the xml model um yeah, so that would be something which um, we could work on. It could also be something which people could um, um, nicely uh, contribute to BPMNAO. Um, I think that um, Nico, who is um, 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 the technical lead of that project, um, um, would be very um, excited about people doing that kind of contribution. Um, I think I already heard him talking about like that he feels that this is important to people. So yeah, that would be welcome. Yeah, sure, you're right. Interesting. Yeah, I think that one of the challenges is probably that the BPMN standard um, doesn't define how to serialize colors. So you would need to add that on a proprietary level. Would, would be a vendor extension. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. But it's doable. And um, <laughs> it's great because, um, yeah, the, um, um, so now we have the request, please implement this. <laughs> so let me, just, let me just play that back to you. <laughs> someone <laughs> someone from, from, from Holland asking, and uh, hey, you always, you know, you can just do it yourself and contribute it as, as a contribution to, to BPMNIO. That's what open source is all about. <laughs> but maybe we do it ourselves as well. So, um, <laughs> oh, you don't need to. You don't, you don't need to be a Java developer. You can do JavaScript with it. But yeah, still you need to. Um, to do development, of course. No, but it's it's actually no. Uh, seriously, it's it's great to get those suggestions and requests because it helps us um, to understand what what you actually need. So to feel free to actually when it's about BPMNIO and for example about this color thing, when looking to at BPMNIO the website, you will see there's a forum, and you can always ask those questions and post those requests in the forum. By doing this, um, um, it won't on GitHub exactly, so it won't be forgotten. So um, um, just just go for it. Um, all right. So, yeah, thank you so much for now. Um, I think um, so it's been a good webinar. Um, thanks for your interest and your attention and everything. And would love to yeah, meet you again, maybe online, maybe even on site. So um, please follow us on Twitter. Um, you will be informed about um, actual, you know, meetups um, maybe happening um, next or near to your place um, as well. And um, yeah, let's just stay in touch. And and thanks. Oh, by the way, the recording. Um, so we have recorded the webinar. So we will send out the recording. Probably not today anymore, but um, probably later this week. Okay. Wait. And yeah, have fun. Happy processing. Bye bye. Bye, and thanks for listening.